Hello and welcome to the Skylander Spurs Adventure Developer Commentary. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the level designer, Kim Steiner, Nay Pittman. Oh boy, it is half four in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh Very early for you. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Yeah, what were your roles on Skylander's Spurs Adventure? Um, so I was uh, originally hired um, kind of... Uh, they had worked on the game for two years, and then during a kind of uh, meeting with Activision, they were given a one-year extension, and I, that's the point where I was hired. Um, I was one of the people who was hired to come on and kind of help help them polish up the game and, and like add some more levels and stuff to it. And uh, so I was hired as a level designer. Um, now, level designer is kind of a weird... Um, title in the game industry it can mean a lot of different things based on what company you work for but at tfb what le level designers did was we would build out the gray boxes of a level which is if you can just think of it it's like the very kind of simple um you know this is the island you can walk on this is the bridge that leads to the next island and then there's three floaty islands that you have to use jump pads to get up and like that was the kind of things we built um but we also at tfb specifically most companies are not like this uh, but, but at TFB, we actually did a lot of uh, what's called, um, and scripting is we used a kind of like a programming code that, that was only for TFB, and we could make game mechanics with it. So um, on Skylanders, Spire's Adventure, I was hired as a level designer, but I also made game mechanics. Um, and the first level I was put on was Dark Light Crypt. And I actually had to write the script that... Um, made the crusher blocks that would like come down and like swamp swamp on the ground and you would have to like if you'd have to dodge under them or you get squished or they'd come from the side and you get squished um or the uh the switching mechanic which was you would go up to the the activator and push the button and it would switch you from the light world to the dark world um so i did all the scripting for that and then i also um because because level design is a very weird job in that we kind of put everything together. Like, so as everything's coming in, we kind of put it together and that becomes the game. So as art is giving us objects that are supposed to blow up, we have to put those objects in the world, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, specifically with um, uh, SSA, one of the more, you know, enjoyable things that I got to do was um, if you're running through a level, you'll notice how sometimes it pops up and it says the name of a place. Like it's like the fairy ring mm. or yeah, the, the grand approach kind of thing. Um, that was actually a thing that um, I was saying we should have because um, I, I really like the kind of environmental storytelling that has of of place having a name. And uh, and so my lead at the time was like, yeah, sure, just figure out how to do it and, and let us know how to do it all for our levels. And we were, we were kind of swamped there at the end, so I ended up actually doing the names for every single zone in ssa <laughs> wow that's amazing <laughs> yeah <laughs> so with uh dark light crypt the purchasable levels were something that was planned even way back then uh yeah um i think they had always planned to have um because so like um uh we were targeting the wii for the game and um despite the fact that we were in the era of you know xbox 360s and everything and so a lot of games um do dlc well our game wasn't really targeted at the kind of people who buy dlc um and so usually what you do is you you make a game you ship the game and then in the time between like shipping like where you've where the development team has finished and the game is actually on shelves and available that's anywhere from three to four months um so during that time uh game companies will often make dlc for the game um, because that, that gives you something to do. You're still building a product. You're still working on the game. And, you know, it's kind of neat because you get to do a lot of weird stuff you don't normally get to do during development um, or during the main development. So it was really neat, um, though, because, like, that's kind of been planned now. Like, companies plan for doing that. Well, with Skylanders, we knew we couldn't, like, patch in stuff because it's on the Wii. Like, that's not a super common thing for that console. Um, and so we knew we were going to do toys for it. So it became a little more, um, a little less of the normal DLC of like, oh, let's just put stuff in and see what happens. And it was a lot more planned uh, because we had to have the toys for it and everything. So when I came on, they were like, yeah, we need to do 
Uh, and I, I don't remember. I think there were, were there two or four? Anyway, uh, so um, that was actually the level I was assigned. They had planned it out. So they kind of knew it was going to be light and dark. Um, and they knew like what the elemental zones in there were going to be. Like, I think it was fire. But they um, they had not actually built any of the level yet. So it was just a plan. And I came in and I, I kind of took their plan and I changed it up a little bit to make it, you know, exciting for me. And then I made it. That's really, really <laughs> cool. Um, did you work on any other levels? Or was it just that one? Uh, no, I actually... Um, so uh, I ended up working on final level quite a bit. Um, the boss fight at the end of the final level was handled by uh, another uh, co-worker of mine, Chris Nelson. But... Um, the original the original kind of layout of the final level um chaos's layer was uh had been done very early in development so it wasn't quite up to the standard that all of the other levels had become and the guy who had originally done the layout um he's a really awesome guy his name's ray um he had actually done the giant robot level where you're punching the the stuff as the giant robot mm. And um, he had to go back and do a lot of work on that. And so he was kind of overloaded. And so in video games, you do what's called load balancing, where, you know, if somebody's got too much work, but there's something you can kind of pull off of them and give to someone else, you do that, right? Because you don't want to stress anybody out. And so they actually were like, well, Ray's not going to have time to work on final level and you've, you've finished up Dark Light Crypt. So let's give you a uh, final level and you can just kind of revamp it. Um, but what was really interesting is we were far enough along in development at that point that we really couldn't change that much. Um, so the art was kind of set, but our artists had done a really great job of making these very like modular pieces. So I was able to like like double the size of the level <laughs> oh, <laughs> because cool. they had, yeah, because of the way they had built it. And then um, I got them. They had these really wicked looking claw thingies along the sides, and I went over to um, one of our. Uh, 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 artists that did like the the um kind of game art uh it's it's things that we use in mechanics so like push blocks or crystals or whatever and i i went over and i asked him i was like hey can we break these off of the level and can i turn them into a hazard and he was like oh yeah and like, i think it <laughs> took him like an hour <laughs> and, and so then i made it where they would sit there and they'd kind of twitch and whenever you walked underneath them they would snap down on you and I distinctly remember the first time I, I called someone over and I was like, hey, run through this hallway for me. And they started running down the hallway. And I think they started like squealing. It was great. <laughs> they were just like, oh, my God, this level is so much more terrifying now. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. So how did you get into the industry? Um, I actually, um, so I played games forever. I mean, my first memory is playing video games. So um I was actually going to go to a school, Southern Methodist University. I was going to be an English teacher. And I had been accepted to their, their actually English graduate department. Um, and I uh, found out that they had a school that was called the Guild Hall, which is just kind of a development school. And they teach you how to make video games. And I went to visit. And I was 100% convinced walking out of there. I was like, yes, that's what I want to do. I want to make video games. And it was really funny because up until I discovered the Guild Hall, it had just kind of never, it had never occurred to me that people got paid to make video games and that I could learn to be one of those people. Um, but then it was really funny because whenever I applied to the Guild Hall, they required you to um, submit a project. So you had to effectively kind of submit a mod of a game. And they had these four engines you could use, and one of them was Neverwinter Nights. And... I had literally been making campaigns in Neverwinter Nights ever since I had gotten it. Um, like I had made them for my D&D group. Like we would play through Neverwinter Nights campaigns that I had made. And that's when I realized that all of these games that I had played over the years that had shipped their editors with them and that I had gone in and just built, you know, playgrounds. Like I was, I was using it like Legos, right? Like I was just building all this random stuff. And I realized that that's what I had been doing for years was effectively game development. Um, I just wasn't getting paid for it. <laughs> and so that was very, very eye opening for me. And I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is really cool. And so I went to the Guild Hall and I graduated. And then and I, I actually bounced around at a few companies before I landed at TFB. Um, 
And it was, it was really funny because when I started at TFB, they asked me, or whenever I interviewed there, they asked me, they were like, well, do you like Spyro? How do you feel about Spyro? And I was like, oh, I love Spyro. Like, I, I have the toys. I have all three of the, you know, the first three games. Uh, you know, and I just started going off about it. And they were like, okay, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, that's pretty much what I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it was really funny because I thought, like, that was the immediate point where I thought they were just making, you know, a new Spyro game. And they were like, no, 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 it's not quite a Spyro game. It's, it's this thing called Skylanders. And they actually showed it to me at my interview. And they showed me, they, this was back, they had like a prototype portal and like a little prototype toy. And as soon as they showed it to me, I was just like, I have to work on this game. That is so cool. That is such a neat idea. <laughs> I love hearing stories like that. <laughs> it's wonderful. So... You won an award for your work on Skylanders. I did. Yeah, could you tell me a bit about that? So it's, um, I think now it's actually affiliated with Microsoft. Um, at GDC every year, there's a luncheon, and it's Women in Games International. And they do, at the time, they had four awards that they gave every year. And effectively, the way they did it is, if you have... If, if you've ever been invited to the lunch, you get invited back. And if you've ever been to the lunch, you can nominate people. And unbeknownst to me, one of my coworkers actually at TFB, she had been there several years in a row. And when they sent out the thing and said, do you want to nominate anyone for an award for our, you know, these are the four categories. Um, she actually nominated me. Um, she didn't tell me. <laughs> I didn't know until I won. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she nominated me uh, for the innovative or uh, innovator award um, because um, you know they tend to focus on women and um, they also like she felt I had come in and had some really interesting ideas and so she nominated me and then I won and it was very weird because I was like I don't even know what's going on <laughs> but um, it was it was really cool to get to go down there though and and be at this in this room full of people. It's the first time I got to meet Amy Henning, who's amazing. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm getting to sit in this room full of all of these women in the industry that I look up to. And then I had to get up on stage and accept an award in front of all of these people I admire like so much. And I'm just kind of like, I got to work on a game that was super cool, but I didn't really come up with the idea for it. I don't know if this is actually my award. It was really funny. They kind of they were like, shh, it's a great game, just accept your award. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. I'm going to sort of drift away from uh, your work on the game. Uh, I'm going to mm. basically uh, ask you to pick your favorite child. What's your favorite Skylander? Uh, my favorite Skylander is actually Stealth Elf. Um, she was kind of my first one, and then it's just kind of stuck with me through the years. Uh, I really like... Uh, I just really like the way she plays, too. Um, that was that's an interesting thing for me, was that all of our Skylanders had very different play styles to them, and I really like Stealth Elves. And, uh, I mean, I have a lot of favorite Skylanders, obviously, but I think I think Stealth Elf is actually my favorite. So throughout uh, all of development on uh, Spire's Adventure, uh, what would you say is your favorite part? Uh, so my favorite work part was the um, the editor that we used. So uh, a video game editor is a lot like a program that you use to make the game. Um, so if you think about it, if you're a writer, you use like Microsoft Word to write, right? Mm. So a video game editor is the, the thing we use to make the game. And our editor at TFB was very, very powerful. Um, and the scripting language put all of the power in the uh, designer's hands. At other companies, as a designer, I come up with an idea and then I have to go to a program programmer and I have to ask him to program it and then he gives me a thing back later uh you know that may or may not work <laughs> um and it may or may not be what I was asking for and so there's there's a lot of turnaround time on getting something new into the game uh whereas at TFB I didn't I didn't have to ask a programmer for that I had it it was all right there in my hands and so the absolute best part was just like any crazy idea we came up with you know, we could prototype it and have it in the game in like an hour. And so that we did that a lot. Like we would just be like, oh, well, hey, I had this cool idea. Let me try it. Hey, it works great. Um, 
And so um, it would do this thing of like, we, oh gosh, and I, it's actually funny. I think in, um, in Darklight Crypt, the fire area, like there was no idea for what that was supposed to be. And I was like, oh, I want to have these cool invisible walls. And like, I was able to prototype it and have it working in game in about an hour and a half. And like, that's unheard of at any other video game company. Um, so that was my favorite thing about development. Um, I think my favorite thing that happened uh, before the game launched was um, there was one day we we had gone into um, certification. So the game had effectively been sent off to Nintendo and Microsoft and Sony to get verified that it was you know good and could be put on the consoles. And uh, we were sitting there playtesting the game but on consoles instead of like on our computers. And so we had these multiplayer games going and it was hilarious watching all of these developers play the game together. But it was really funny because it's like, you know, it's like these people in their 30s and 40s playing the game, but we we all became like 10 year olds. It was amazing. And like, we were, we were like arguing and like bickering like 10 year olds. It was great. <laughs> That sounds sort of like my experience of playing the game with my cousin. And she's like, no, I want to go this way. It's like, I want to go that way. Ah, fair enough. Fine, we'll go your way. Your way sounds cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was actually really funny. That was the time uh, Ray and John managed to figure out that there was a push block puzzle that you can trap someone in. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, well, if we get bounced from certification, we should maybe fix that. <laughs> Um, you mentioned, like, you could just sort of prototype stuff. Uh, was there any prototype ideas that you tried and just scrapped? Um, there were probably several dozen uh, prototype ideas, because that was, they were so fast to make. Like, you could find out if something was fun or not, like, very, very quickly. Um, and, and it was funny, because there were actually a lot on SSA that, like, I tried, and they didn't work very well, or they just weren't very fun. Um, because they didn't really fit what SSA was because, I mean, you couldn't jump, right? And you couldn't, um, we couldn't really allow players to do a lot of the crazier things that we actually added in later Skylanders games, um, just because of the design, uh, and the limitations we had. But, um, like, even whenever you prototype things and scrap them, like, usually they don't, they don't always get completely thrown away. They almost always become an idea used late. So, for example, um, I actually remember in um, Trap Team, I ended up using a mechanic that I had tried to build originally in SSA. Um, and it, it worked a lot better in Trap Team. <laughs> or wait, no, it was in Imaginators. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, like, it was it was really interesting that I had tried to build it before and then had not uh, been able to get it to feel right. And what was it? Oh, is the um, putting out the fires in the stealth, uh, in the, the Enchanted Forest level. Um, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I had tried to do the bucket and fire thing um, with some Mabu, and it, it just didn't work in SSA. And that was, I just, I think... At the time, I either just didn't know enough about how to like lob grenades like that to make it feel good. Um, plus, we couldn't have that much fire because we were targeting the Wii, and like, mm. you know, it's the graphics on it aren't super great, so you yeah. can't have that much fire on screen at once. So, like, by the time we had gotten to Imaginators, like, oh yeah, I can have, I can set the whole screen on fire. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say is the biggest change to how something ends up in the final version of the game? Um, so from when we work on it to how it ends up. So when I make a thing, um, so like when we made the switching mechanic, um, it would pretty much just switch the items. There are no sound effects. There's no VFX. There was no screen blur. Um, there was very little actual fanfare to something happening. So when, um, as the level designers, when, we, when we're kind of like reaching the point where we're like, okay, this is, this is pretty done there's not it's not pretty it's all gray box um and there's not all of the super cool stuff that then will come in later um so usually we when we kind of finish our job at that point we 
you know, I had to go to our sound designers and be like, okay, so these are the mechanics I built. These are the kind of sounds they're going to need. This is what we're going for. And then I had to go talk to VS- VFX artists and be like, okay, so these are the mechanics I built. This is what we're going to need. You know, we want, you know, a, a poof that covers the switching of the objects. We want, you know, the the super creepy fog that sh- shows up and all that. Um, so it's actually really interesting, like, our, our job was to get things functional, but they weren't necessarily very pretty. And so then as the game goes along, like suddenly it, it starts getting really pretty. And it, it was really great the mornings you would come in and like art it, level artists had checked in the level art because like you'd go home and it would be a bunch of gray boxes and you'd come in the next day and suddenly it's it's green and there's water and there's clouds and it's pretty and you're just like, oh my God, it's actually a game. <laughs> I guess this can apply to... Uh, any of uh, the Skylanders games, but what would you say is the weirdest or funniest thing that happened during development? Oh, goodness. Uh, Any time... So so we had a thing where um, the way it kind of worked was people would check things in. So when you're working on, on a game, you're working on stuff on your computer... And you kind of like, okay, this is good. This is this is pretty well done. And you check it in. And what that does is it puts it on, onto a centralized, like, I guess it's a server because it's per force. And then that sends it out to everyone else on the team. So when people come in to work, they can update and they can get everything down from the, the per force server. Um, one of the things with Skylanders was we kind of had two parts of that. You had the game part and then you had... The, the character parts, so all of the Skylanders. Um, and the the actual, like, activator was, like, you know, you would, you would actually push a different button to get all of the new Skylanders and all of their abilities that had been updated since the last time you had. And every so often, probably, I mean, it was probably, like, once a month, uh, something would happen, and suddenly, like, some Skylanders would get super busted. And so... <laughs> Like there was um there was one time that Trigger Happy would just like keep firing the whole time, like regardless of whether you're pushing the button or not. So you're just running through the level and there's coins flying everywhere. Um, or like characters would T pose or wrecking ball wouldn't come out of his wrecking ball state. So he would just like roll through the level forever. And that was always like the really like the really funniest part. And you could usually tell something had happened whenever you'd see the email go out that was like, don't get the new Skylanders because they're busted. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what have you worked on since working on Skylanders? Um, I actually, uh, I when I left TFB, I went to Blizzard Entertainment and now I work on World of Warcraft. Um, I'm a quest designer on it. Um, it's actually really funny. Um, I've played WoW since uh 2005 and um I, every time i would get like laid off from a video game company i would apply to blizzard trying to get a job on wow and uh when i interviewed at toys for bob on skylanders uh, one of the things they had trouble finding level designers for tfb was the fact that they needed people who had really strong scripting skills because you know you made all the level mechanics and that's that's abnormal in the industry. <clears throat> and so I was in the interview and I was talking to the guy who had become my boss, Mike, and we were, you know, talking and he goes, well, you know, people here need really strong scripting skills. Do you have that? And I, I was reluctant to mention it because at the time, like if I told people I played WoW, they usually were like, oh, do you play it all the time or whatever? And so um, I actually, at the time I was even like, I was like, well, I made a World of Warcraft add-on that helps me remember all this stuff in the game. And I can, you know, I can send you my code sample or like, I can just send you the whole add-on because it's really not that long. And uh, and Mike was like, oh, I play WoW too. And so then we started talking a lot about WoW and we started talking a lot about um, the script that I had written to do the add-on and like all the different, you know, things I was doing in that script. Like I was checking to make sure you had the right reagents in your bag and all this kind of stuff. And he was like, oh, if you can do that, you can definitely do this. And like, it was it was that moment that got me the job at TFB. So then it was really funny whenever it turned around and I was kind of preparing to leave TFB. 
and I had applied to Blizzard um, through a friend that I met because she worked at Blizzard and I was a huge fan of them and she wanted to meet me because she was a huge fan of Skylanders. And so the first time we actually met in person, I think it was both of us just kind of squeeing over each other <laughs> and just being like, oh my God, you work on WoW. And she's like, oh my God, you work on Skylanders. <laughs> and so it was it was very funny. Um, and she helped me apply. And then I, I, I got the job there. And it was it was really funny too, because like when I first got there, everybody was like, oh yeah, we love Skylanders. It's great. So... I imagine uh, working on WoW comes with very different challenges compared to Skylanders. Uh yeah, it's a it's a lot bigger game, and uh, it's it's got a lot of layers and a lot of cool stuff going on. Um, it's also really interesting because it's it's like my favorite game, and so I I I have a lot of. I guess it's it's really funny because I have a lot of back knowledge for a game that I'm working on, whereas like with Skylanders, like we were. We were always coming up with all the new stuff, and we were always coming up with um, new ideas for, you know, oh, let's come up with a new Skylander, and we just pull something, you know, crazy out of the air. Um, whereas with WoW, there's like a lot of, of history, and there's a lot of lore, and a lot of um, considerations that you have to think about whenever you're making. It's also a, a much bigger team, so I have a much smaller part. Whereas at, at TFB, you got to do a lot of things because the team was smaller, so you, you kind of had to do more things. Um, whereas with WoW, everyone's very specialized. And and that's okay, it's just kind of a different job. And you, you left Toys Bob, uh, after Imaginators? Yes, yeah. We had, uh, we had been, um, kind of working on some other stuff, uh, for about a year, and, uh, and, uh, I knew we weren't going to be making another Skylanders game, at least at that time, they had, they were talking about, oh, we're, you know, we're going to work on other things for a while. And I was I was not really interested in working on the other things we were going to be working on. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Um, so I guess final question would be, what advice do you have for women looking to enter the industry? Um, so, I mean, it's funny because you, you ask, like, what advice do I have for women looking to get into the industry? And it's, it's not particularly any different than advice I'd have for anyone looking to get into the industry which is um, start making games, um, start making mods. Uh, uh, so there are still games that ship with their editors. Um, Skyrim shipped with an editor. Um, you know, uh, even even older games that, that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think of. So, like, um, you can still use the Source Engine for stuff. Um, Unreal and Unity are both really great. Game Maker is really good, too. Um, making games is really the, the biggest trick because... Once you learn one editor really good, it makes it actually pretty easy to learn another one. And then you just keep making new things and you kind of learn like what works and what doesn't. And invariably you make something and you're like, this is amazing. And you get someone to play it and they break it two seconds in. <laughs> and you kind of go, well, okay, you know, let's, uh, let's not do that next time. <laughs> and, and you kind of see what's fun and you kind of see what's frustrating. And just kind of uh, also turning that critical eye to games and like having that moment where you look at a game and you're like, you know, why do I find this fun? Why do I not find this fun? And so especially for me, um, and like one of the things of learning is like uh, learning how to make games was also learning what made games I didn't think were fun, fun for other people. Because, like, I might have to work on a game that isn't necessarily fun for me, and I still need to make it fun for the, for the people who should be playing it. Um, but yeah, getting into games, it's all about just sitting down and making games. And there's so many more tools available for it now. Um, like, even Twine and all that kind of stuff is really great for just getting your feet wet and learning what you're doing. And then building a portfolio or just... Um, like trying to find an associate position somewhere using the little game you've made or the mods you've made, and it's it's funny because I still know people who make mods and and their own like kind of little indie game projects that are never going to be like commercial games or commercial successes, and then they turn around and use those you know as their portfolio pieces and get you know associate positions at places and that kind of thing. Um, and there's also like there's schools and stuff for it. 
Um, the one thing I would say specifically for women looking to get into games is um, not to be scared of the stuff that they see um, talking about sexual harassment in the game industry. Because while it is prevalent and while it happens a lot of places, and it's even happened to me, um, it's there are still a lot of very good companies out there where that's not going to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been really lucky in that at least, at least for, you know, a while now, I haven't had those kind of issues and those kinds of problems. And so it, it, it concerns me whenever I go on Twitter or somewhere like that. And all I see is, you know, all of these very negative things about all of this in the industry. And all I can think is, I've been here for 12 years. It's gotten so much better and we're still working on it. So don't be afraid. Like, don't let that turn you off from making games. I'm really glad you said that because <laughs> whilst this, this series has been about uh, finding out about development on Skylanders because it's one of my favorite franchises, um, it's been about learning about the process for any game or and, and about the industry. It's about inspiring people to to think, oh yeah, this is something I could pursue. Um, and because I think there is a lot of negative press when it comes to the industry at times. Um, and mm -hmm. I mean, with the, with the bad, you also get a lot of the good. Um, but I think uh, it, there, like, it, there isn't as many uh, counter arguments um, that because I, I think a lot of people are ignorant to how the industry works just because it's not massively common knowledge. I know I've learned a lot from this series. Um, so uh, thank, thank you for uh, joining me and, yeah. and uh, sharing your experiences um, and your wisdom and just thank you for your work on uh, the games because, yeah, I mean, I, I and many others have absolutely adored them and uh and will continue to uh <laughs> go back and play them and 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 love them and yeah it's just a, it's a massive massive honor to get to uh speak with you and learn about the the whole process well i mean you say that um i mean the whole the whole like the win for us like as game developers uh is actually being able to see people enjoying our game and see people playing our game and um, you know, for Sky, for me, for Skylanders, I actually um, right before Skylanders Giants shipped, I actually had my son. So I have a seven-year-old now, and I joke, I joke, I call him my little Skylander because you know <laughs> I, I got pregnant with him and I had him while we were making Giants. And so, um, and so getting to play the game with him, like actually getting to experience it and see him playing these games and become attached to these characters, and you know, it's it's just. It's the best thing, and um, and it's so funny that you thank me for getting to talk to me, and yet uh, I distinctly remember the Monday morning that we were all sitting there watching you stream Skylanders, Spyro's Adventure, and it was just, it was so fun for us watching you experience it and watching you, like, reach the points and levels that we knew were going to be exciting, and then you'd get super excited about them, and it was just like... Like for us, that is the best reward. It's like this this massive payoff of seeing all of our hard, hard work bring joy to somebody and just like watching them get so excited and be so happy. And you just sit there and you're like, oh, I did that. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's, so, it's so weird to, to hear that side of it. Um, it's, it's very flattering. Um, it's very weird to hear that side of it. I mean, before... Playing Skylanders, um, someone on the team uh, after I finished it contacted me, thanking me. And at that point, I it didn't even occur to me that developers would ever watch gameplay. So it was just a, <laughs> uh, oh what? And like they mentioned that everyone in the office was watching. It. I was just like, oh, what do you mean everyone's watching? <laughs> it was just, it was very, it was very surreal. Uh, but yeah, it's well, uh, it's actually. It's become more of a thing now, like as as time has passed, right? But um, Skylanders wasn't really a game that we expected people to stream. Like it wasn't, it wasn't a game we expected that audience, like someone who is in that like kind of Venn diagram of streaming and Skylanders were, we didn't expect them to overlap very much. And so I don't actually think there were, were very many people streaming. 
and you know it happened to be you and then so like and then somebody was like oh this guy's having a blast because i i think you were you were just barely into it he's like oh this guy's you know really funny and they i, I was into spyro so i was just yeah I, I didn't know yeah. what to expect. Like, I hadn't even seen any gameplay, I don't think. I just, I, I heard about it, I think, like, a couple days before. Like, I hadn't seen it advertised for me. I, yeah. I was just really surprised. Like, oh, there's a new game. What? Okay, well, we'll see what it's like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so it was funny. Somebody sent it out on the link over the email at the office, and then I'm pretty sure every single person at the office. Because we usually have two monitors when you're working on a game. Like, you have your, your one that you're running the game on, and the one you're running the tool on and we actually like it's like well you know the game's shipped and we're working on well, at that point we were working on giants but it was it was funny because everybody had the stream on like their second monitor it was watching you play and like and then you would do something or you get really excited or like you would fight some enemy and you'd be like oh what is that guy and suddenly the flurry of emails would go back out everybody <laughs> going oh, did you see that it was great <laughs> <laughs> But it was, it was, you were like, you were like the, the, and then you were very excited and you were very like, you were very into the game and we were feeding off of that. And so like, at that point, even if anyone else had started streaming it, we'd have just been like, eh, it's okay. We got this guy. He's good. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. I have no <laughs> idea how to react to that. That's, that's really, yes. That's, yeah. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it is it is one of those things I, I often have the moments where I see people streaming games and I know the developers are watching it. And I'm like, I wonder how stressed out this person would be knowing that like half of the game developers of this game are watching them yeah. play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I assume you enjoyed Spyro Reignited. Oh me too. Oh, I got to play it with my son. It was so cool. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Because he was like, it was funny because for me, like as a Spyro fan, I'm like, yes, they're all pretty. It's all pretty again. And I get to play it again. It's so cool. And my son's like, mommy, they brought Spyro over from Skylanders. And I was just like, <laughs> oh, honey, wait, nope, hold up. <laughs> I actually pulled out my PlayStation 1 discs and was showing him. I'm like, see it on the cover? It's Spyro. And he's like, wait, what? <laughs> Thank you very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, if you did, leave a like, subscribe, share the video around, I also have a Twitch, a Twitter, and a Patreon if you would like to support me and the channel. As you can probably tell, this is a massive passion project of mine that I've been working on for quite some time, and I'm really glad that I'm able to get it out to you, and I'm really grateful for you watching the video. If you want to see more from the series or other stuff that I do on this channel, click that notification bell to be notified when I upload next. But thank you very much for watching, I'll see you next time, take care, bye bye. <laughs>